I will start uh, uh, to, s to say why I published this book uh, about, uh, I mean, with Renan. I mean, I, I tried to prove, you know, I, ro I wrote a book about the invention of the Jewish people. And everybody accused me to be too much ori uh, original. Then I published this book to, to show that nothing is original in my book book about the invention of the Jewish people, because Renan, like a lot of others, 130 years ago, put forward the same positions. The concept of Judaism is a very important one in history. I think the Judaism is the first monotheism in the Western world is very important from all the civil Christian and Islamic civilization. But the Jew were not never a people. Until now, I don't think that there are a people. Now, Ernst Renan, in 1881, say the same thing, in, even much better than me, I think, in some way, because he was writing a very, very good French. Now, in this book, I try to show, really, that my position, once upon a time, was a very, very diffused, uh, accepted position. Jews are, uh, re uh, uh, the Jewishness is a religion, Jewishness is not a people and not a nation. Not only Ernest Renan said it in 1881, I tried to show in the introduction to this book that there is a tradition, especially in France, that insists on the fact that the Jews not, have not a common origin and uh, they are a product of proselytism. Now, I don't know who are you, if you know uh, better or less historiography. Anyway, I mentioned in the introduction people, very, very famous people like Marc Bloch. He's one of the most important historians in the French history of the 20th century. Marc Bloch, from Jewish origin, insists the fact that the Jews are a product of, of Khazars and Mediterranean uh, population. Maybe you know better the, word, the name of Raymond Aron? Somebody heard about Raymond Aron? Not a leftist, not a radical, huh? from Jewish origin also. And he said that if you are using the word French people, Italian people, Vietnamese people, we cannot use the term people for the Jew. You understand? You cannot call a cat dog and a dog a cat. It's clear, no? If you thinking about a, a human uh, group that has some secular uh, daily practices like language, music, food, etc., and you apply the word people, how come that you are using the word Jewish people? If you are using the word French people, even American people, or English people, you cannot say Jewish people. It's not me, it's Raymond Aron. When? In 1981, a hundred years after, after uh, Ernest Renan. This is the reason that I published this little book to show that really I'm not original. Even, even the people consider me, because of the book, as the enemy of the Jews in the world. Now, what is special about Renan? that uh, something like 130 years ago, he put the finger of the notion of what is a nation, because I put two texts here, about Jewishness and about nation. Now it's become a little bit relevant, yes, the idea of nation, uh, after your prime, uh, prime minister, that Cameroon, yes? It's the, <laughs> your sh uh, yeah, he started to deal a little bit about uh, national identity, yeah? It's become a something important in Britain, huh? to renew the national identity of the, of the Britain, you, okay? Now, you have to understand that 130 years ago, Ernest Renan 
put the finger of something that was were lost after it. That the nation is a construction. A nation is something that was built and constructed by people. In some way, it's an invention. He said it. And what is fantastic with Renan, and I'm speaking about 1883, not one, sorry, 1883, that he say if nations were, uh, were started in some point in history, they will finish in some point in history. Everything that started to be, stopped to be. It's clear or not, historically. And then, you see, in 83, he said that uh, nations is a kind of construction that were built in the 19th century. It, it will finish. And then, I, he, in, in thinking, you know, he was a historian, but with a lot of imagination, he say, I believe that sometime, some date, nation will disappear and it will be a federation of Europe. He's saying it in 83. That he thinks in the future, the Europeans will try to build a federation in Europe. You can imagine it? A conservator, liberal conservator, like Ernest Renan, speaking about the future of France. You have to know, he was a, a Francais, huh? And he said that France will disappear. You can imagine it? And he was a great patriot, by the way. Now, what is the uh, relevant about this speech? Because the identity politics in Europe today is very special, very problematic. You agree with me? It's not, it's not simple to be a French today, because a lot of people don't understand what is the meaning to be English, British, French or Italian. Now, when I read the speech of Cameroon, in some way, you see, I was astonished. Suddenly, you have a prime minister that is an ideologue also. It's very important in Britain, yeah? That has a vision about uh, national identity. Yeah, I didn't like the speech because it was uh, concentrated against the, the Muslims, you see? He didn't mention others. I mean, it was Muslims. But even if I am a more or less radical, I accept one thing important. I am not a Jacobin. I am not a French Republican that, uh, you know, want a uniformity of culture. I am for multiculturalism. Mm, I always criticize a lot French Republicanism by this vision of everybody has to be the same. I was much more liberal than most of the French friends that I had, I had in the past, but I always put uh, questions about your uh, British liberalism. I mean, the, the, the multiculturalism doesn't mean that there is not a, a, you know, a baggage of values that has to be shared by all the citizens that are living in a country. Then if you want, I'm not a conservative, uh, but I think that it's not the questions of Cameron was posed in a very bad way. But there is something that I accept to, to discuss today. But the vision to build a new, to renew the British nation, I think it's very anachronic. Because the, you know, I think that the British citizens today has to be afraid for his identity, not because of the Muslims, but because of the American culture, or the globalization, at least. Much more, you have to understand. Anyway, nations are constructions. A historical product, and I believe that they will disappear. With Cameroon, without Cameroon, they will disappear. The question is how they will be disappeared. Now, it's very easy for me to speak in London about these questions, but you have to understand that I'm, I'm coming from a country, from a state, that is not a French nation, it's not the British nation, it's something quite different. You cannot imagine. Why you cannot imagine? Because I'm coming from a state that the identity politics is not like Cameroon. You have to know the positions of Cameroon in Israel can be considered as leftist positions. Cameroon, with his positions in Israel, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, he's a leftist. You are laughing. It's not a joke. 
It's not a joke. I'm living in a country that uh, the national consciousness, the national identity says that the state, the citizenship, the essence of uh, the Israeli state is not a civic one. Israel doesn't belong to the citizens. You know it. I don't know if uh, there is here in the audience uh, people from Jewish origin. But if there are here people from Jewish origin, you have to know that Israel belongs de to them much more to the Palestinian Israeli students that I'm teaching before them every day in Tel Aviv. Israel is not a state of the Israeli citizens. Israel is the state of the Jewish in the world. It, in Bibi Netanyahu, ask also the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Not as an Israeli state, but as a Jewish state. Then I am coming from a state that the policy, the daily policy, is ethnocentric. 25% of the Israeli citizens are not from Jewish origin then the state doesn't belong to them. You understand it? They are citizens, they participate in the vote, but mentally, ideologically, the state doesn't belong to them. You understand it? Then Cameroon is a leftist in Israel because he is not putting in question that uh, British Muslims is a, a British citizen, no? In principle, it's okay. You have to share some other culture, Cameroon is thinking, but he will not put in question the fact that Britain belongs to these Muslim citizens, not? In Israel, the state belongs to people that are not living there. Then you understand that looking on Cameroon, in some way, I look at him as a, a friend from the Israeli position, you understand? It's a joke, but it is something like this. In Israel, I'm living in a state that the Jew cannot marry a non-Jew. It's not because the religious people. Because the secular people building this state in 48 didn't know what is Jewish identity really. You understand that? And this is a law till now. A Jew cannot marry a non-Jew. Not only a Muslim non-Jew, also Christian non-Jew. Now, if we are looking today in the Middle East, it's very important to understand. This ethnocentric position that make Israel a ghetto in face of the Arab world, a real ghetto, I'm thinking I'm becoming more and more pessimist. Also, if you follow the positions of all the leadership in Israel, face of this wave of democratization in the Middle East. They are afraid in Israel. This wave, this way, a wake of, of democratization, that I don't know how it will be finished, but in Israel there is a position against the democratization of the Middle East. Not only against a, a Islamic democracy, also against a liberal democracy. Because a liberal democracy in Egypt, in Jordan, will not, will cannot be very nice in face of Israel. At least for one reason. Israel is occupying another people, another population, for 43 years without giving any human rights, political rights, social rights to these people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the format of these meetings, I am now permitted a couple of questions. So, uh, I wonder if I could engage you initially on uh, the debate in the... Uh, <laughs> they're determined to tank you up. <laughs> um, in initially on uh, the debate in the 19th century. Uh, you point out several things about uh, Renan in your introduction, including that if Edward Said, who criticized so much what Renan had to say in his early days, uh, had only read all of his work, he would have been less critical, you believe. I wondered where you place Renan in, and you mentioned 
subsequently Marc Bloch and uh, Raymond Mont. Aron, as we, uh, the, the, the anglicization <laughs> um, that I grew up with. The, where you place them in the overall scheme of things, were they relatively lone voices saying that ethnicity and race is a, essentially an impossible construct? that you cannot have a pure race because we're all so intermingled, so intermixed, uh, and it is also impossible, he gives the example, that all contemporary Jews could be descended from the ancient Hebrews. Uh, it's just not feasible, and it denies the possibility of a proselytization which was uh, very successful um, around the beginning of the Common Era, or two centuries before that. Uh, was this a common view or was it part of a broader debate in which trying to equate nation and race was, a, uh, was the fashion in the 19th century? It's two, uh, two answers to two questions. First of all, about nations in the 19th century. There is two tendency in Europe and uh, not in Europe. Yes, in Europe and everywhere a tendency that try to imagine a nation, because it's an imaginative com uh, community, there is two tendency. The first one is an ethnocentric one. Not only in Germany, also in Britain, also in French, that try to make f uh, frontiers, I mean borders of the nation, by origin, by a common origin. What is important is that this Renan, that started his career as one of the most important racist philosophers in Europe, because Edward Said is mentioning a work of Renan from the 50s of the 19th century. And Renan, because he was a linguistic uh, philosopher, gave a basic to racism. One of the most important basic, scientific basic to racism in Europe is Renan. Edward Said read this book of Renan and uh, you know, classified him as the worst racist in the history and the worst orientalist. Now, I try to show that, uh, you know, people change. Even philosophers can change. And uh, Renan, after the defeat of France against uh, Germany, against Prussia, he changed his opinion about what is human groups and what is nations. Then he passed from a very essentialist position about human groups to a very open republican position. That, you know, it's, it's the subject that has to decide to whom he belongs. It's not the nature of his origin, you understand? Then there is a fight. You can take the Dreyfus affair. You know, the Dreyfus? It's two current, two tendency of the definition of nation before the Dreyfus uh, story. There is the tendency that try to define the French nation after the frontiers of a Gallo-Catholic nation. I repeat, Gallo, you know what is Gaul, the Gaul, Gaul-Catholic nation. And there is another notion of Emile Zola, Jean Jaurès and others, they say, no, if somebody is speaking French, is joined the French culture, he belongs to the nation. By the way, Zola wasn't uh, by birth uh, really French, he was Italian. And uh, a lot of others, you know, every first uh, person in France is from foreign origin. Then if you want to, to resume the question, there is always two tendencies in Europe. In France, in Britain, I think the political definition of a nation, the civic won the battle, not completely. Racism exists everywhere all the time, but there is a difference between racism and racism, Be between political racism and uh, banal, usually daily racism. Okay, there is a difference. In Germany, in the 19th century, in the day, big debate was it, what is a nation, what is a race? 
the ethnocentric tendency won. And Nazism is a byproduct of this tendency. Not all the ethnocentric folkish become Nazis, but without this tradition of ethnocentric basic of definition of political identity, no Nazism. So you're now saying that we can continue this debate. Ethnocentrist definition of racism did not win. Lost the battle in Europe. Okay. And today also in Germany. But we lost a, rough, a lot of human beings. Well, let's go to the construction of the nation. Uh, Renan says that uh, remembering memories, common memories, common stories, are as important as forgetting. You can't successfully construct a nation unless you forget the inconvenient bits of history and overemphasize the ones that are convenient for the construction of the nation. He also says that language should not be, language does not define nation. So ethnicity does not define it. Uh, it's a common experience. Uh, language need not define it. Uh, it's shared memories and shared forgetfulness. And he also says shared grief, shared suffering. Now, what's your advice to David Cameron if he wants to forge a new version of British nationhood uh, that's inclusive of all religions? Uh, what Tony Blair before him was reaching for was common values, and this was to do with tolerance. Uh, every time you tried to test them on what are these common values that define Britishness, they didn't sound very distinct to me. Um, has Britain got to go through another war to have shared suffering? Uh, which memories have we got to forget, the imperial ones? Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, Renan said that to build a nation, you don't have only, uh, you don't have only to remember, but you have to forget. And it was fantastic when he said to forget the colonialism, the British colonialism, the British imperialism, the British racism in the colonies. To forget what? To try to build something else here in Britain. First of all, I don't believe that Cameroon will succeed to rebuild the British nation. We are in another phase. Uh, we have to consider that uh, the European civilization tried to find uh, new identities. It's very difficult. I don't think that he can build a new nation, British nation, even with the other values. I think that the future is Europe. If you like it or you not like it, uh, Britain cannot exist in the world without Europe. It's very difficult to build an European identity because there is not a common history, even not to, to forget, I mean, or to remember. <laughs> this is a problem. Yeah? The great Karl is not your uh, king, huh? No, it's very difficult to construct your... We have your World War I. Sorry? We have World War I in common. Yeah, yeah, in common, in common of suffering, yeah. Together. But I don't believe that this kind of conflict can build a new identity, European... Uh, I'm very skeptic about the European identity, but there is not another choice. For the moment, we see something to construct Europe, something very strange. You don't have history, common history, but you have a common religion. And you try to build a common enemy. What you, I mean, you know, to construct nations, you need to remember, to forget, as you say, but you need also a common enemy. The Brit uh, British identity was uh, constructed with enemies. Uh, it was at the beginning France, uh, France, France, not Germany. At the beginning was France, you know, with all this mythology of Jeanne d'Arc. Also for the French, it was the British, the enemy. And after it was the Germans. Who is the enemy to be today to construct a European identity? It's clear, no? It's the Muslims, the Arabs. Now I'm trying to prepare a paper about not, the question. Not the Iranian Muslims, not the Indonesian Muslims, not the... Indian Muslims, it's also, got to be the I Arabs? Say, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hiding on the two things, or Muslims or Arabs. It's depending on the case. Now, what is important, you know, uh, a common enemy is very good to construct the identity. Also in uh, private life, you know. 
Now, with nations or with the European unity, in the last 20 years, we heard a lot the definition, how we say it in English, we are a Judo-Christian uh, civilization. You heard it? In France, it's very popular. Nous sommes une civilisation judo-chrétienne. It's very popular with the new philosopher, Baron Levy, Finkelkraut. They are speaking all the time about the Judo-Christian uh, identity, civilization. Fantastic. In my, not this book, the other book, I say that I'm sorry that my, my aunt that was uh, sent to Auschwitz didn't know that in one day Europe will define itself as a Judo-Christian civilization. Wonderful, huh? 1941, it wasn't very popular to say it, you know. <laughs> now, you have to understand that uh, Europe was constructed, not Britain, by the way, Europe, the continent, was constructed between 1850 to 1950 on the basis of anti-Semitism. Less Britain than France, less France than Germany, less Germany like Ukraine, Poland, and all this. I mean, anti-Semitism or judophobia, it's a better word. Judophobia, you say? Well, judophobia was say a factor, it. very important factor to construct nations in the 19th century. Judophobia, the political judophobia between 1850, by the way, with the works like Renan and others, Gobineau, was very important to construct nations in Europe. I think that uh, political anti-Semitism finished in Europe. Uh, in the 50s of, the, of uh, the 20th century. It doesn't mean that anti-Semitism doesn't exist today, but not political anti-Semitism. And if somebody wants to understand how serious anti-Semitism was in the 19th century, try not to mix the daily banal cultural anti-Semitism in the street to the political and judophobia of Europe in the 19th century till the middle of the 20th century. Okay, I we? think, one uh, last thing, I think today, and this is important, that the Islamophobia replaces the Judophobia. And the Islamophobia is one of the, uh, of the ways to construct Europe. There is a political Islamophobia in Europe. There is not a political Judophobia in Europe. And I think that the Cameron speech is a part of this way of the definition of new identities face of the Arab or the Islamic world. You understand? I mean, today the issue is Islamophobia, not Judophobia. For the moment, there is not political anti-Semitism in the Western world. But there is a political hate against Arabs and Muslims in the Western world, including Britain. Sorry. No, no, I, I'm sorry too. It would be easy to go on without finding out what the audience want to ask. So let's have a couple of questions from the audience, please. 